set on the internet. Your assaults are done. Welcome back to the Retro Station, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Commander Dan, and this is License to Play, a retro review show about licensed property video games, things like based on movies or TV shows, superheroes, and in some cases, breakfast cereal mascots or fast food mascots. And this is our 11th episode. In this episode, we're going to be breaking the rules a little bit. Let me explain. I was inspired to create my show by the LJN Defender. Check out their videos when you can. They're amazing. And watching the Defender go to bat for some of the most gut-wrenching LJN titles that companies ever managed to squeeze out of their game holes, I wanted to maintain that level of dedication and fair-mindedness to the titles that I review. Like you probably already know, the U.S. sometimes got the shit versions of games that got stellar releases overseas. For every Activision's Ghostbusters here in the U.S., the Japanese market were blessed with a new Ghostbusters 2 that had all of the characters from the movie and actually reflected the fucking movie. But in our hometowns, we got the Spray Diary and a cartridge version of Back to the Future. And over there, DAFCO and EMI Music apparently waited to bring out one of the best licensed title adaptations ever in Super Back to the Future 2. Today's game is one of those cases. Not necessarily because I hate the one we got in the U.S., because I don't, but because the one they got in Japan is a sentimental and personal favorite of mine. In 1985, the Famicom in Japan was a major mover, and Nintendo wanted to bring it to the U.S. market. However, Americans had just suffered through the second video game crash of the 80s. Folks here were practically allergic to the thought of another video game console, so Nintendo came up with a plan to ease the parents into the idea. So... In 1989, as you all well know, I've, I've regaled the tale many times, my brother and I got our first Nintendo system, the Nintendo Entertainment System. Now, we had a rule around our house because basically our family wasn't super rich. So, um, if you had a game and you wanted a new one, it was a, I mean, these, this, parents, this is a genius plan, by the way. Don't forget this plan. This is a genius plan. I'm trapped aboard a fucking satellite above the Earth, and I know that this is a genius plan. So parents, tell your kids they can't have a new game until they've beaten the old game. Now this is before trophies and achievements, so believe me, if my dad could have put, well you have to platinum the game before you get a new game, trust me, I would still only own Dark Souls. You get me? Only I had an addiction for things like The Three Stooges and Darkman. Shout out to AVGN by reviewing Darkman. Um, yeah, so that was kind of cool to see that. Um, I'm just thinking now that maybe <laughs> maybe if I'd have thought harder, I would have gotten games that were easy to beat. You know, like Sesame Street 1, 2, 3, or Elmo's Fart Factory, or, you know, Bert and Ernie go to the soap land. Any game from Japan that was super quick, super easy, and fucked up the source material was fine by me because I love, well, licensed games. But Nintendo themselves. See, the issue was they were diabolical. Check this out. Nintendo of America's arcade division had a two-pronged marketing plan. First, to label the NES as an entertainment system, a toy, and brand it as a toy rather than a video game console. And in the arcades, which didn't see much of a dent in their sales and profits during the second crash, Nintendo had something they called the VS system, the Versus system, which were often double cabinets featuring games like Excite Bike, Versus Wild Gunman, Versus Volleyball. Basically, if they sound familiar, they're just the black box games as we knew them in the U.S. These cabinets were designed to give the hardcore gamers, those still haunting the halls of the arcades, the impression that Versus Super Mario Bros. was an arcade game. So when the home version was identical to the arcade version, there was no question whether or not those kids would want an NES in their home. Adults as well. See, I was an arcade rat. My homes were Aladdin's Castle at the Lansing Mall and Pinball Pete's next to the Kroger my grandma shopped at. And before we got our NES, I remember playing games like Super Mario in the arcade. And when the NES commercials showed Super Mario, I remembered that it was identical to what I'd played in the arcade and mentioned it to my folks. Over and over and over and over again every chance I got asking for a Nintendo. So, Nintendo convinced me that they were bringing arcade titles home. So if I saw something in the arcade, Nintendo was going to have something that looked a lot like that arcade title. I mean, I had a list of games that I totally wanted and could not do without. Rampage, Ninja Gaiden, 
um, well, the upcoming WWF WrestleMania, which is kind of a, well, you'll, you'll hear about it on my review for that game, but my point being is, yeah, I, uh, I thought, they suckered me, they suckered me, I was a hardcore arcade rat, and I thought that it was going to be exactly what it was, and, uh, I have to say that I did have a title that I wanted above all others. And uh, it was VS Goonies. Now, VS Goonies, I didn't know was different than this game. Goonies 2. Which is what I got. Goonies 2. What I didn't know was, was the game that I wanted was... Japan only. Yeah. So, it was this game. Well, here's the difference between those two games. First, my fellow pirates, you may or may not remember the retro flick The Goonies. You probably do. It was a hit in the 80s. A Richard Donner adolescent adventure film featuring Corey Feldman, Sean Astin, oh, and Thanos getting nearly murdered on a girl's bike. No lie, check this shit out. There he goes. <laughs> Holy shit. In the 80s, bullies tried to murder you at every turn. Well, this movie centers around a group of misfit kids called the Goonies, searching for pirate treasure under a lighthouse restaurant, unfortunately serving also as the hideout for the Fratelli gang. Ma, her two thuggish sons, and Sloth, a disabled giant of a man who's just a big kid at heart. Isn't he adorable? At any rate... The movie did great business and launched storybooks, t-shirts, the hit song by Cindy Lauper, Goonies Are Good Enough, and a slew of other licensed materials. So, I was into the Goonies, alright? I mean, I played it at Aladdin's Castle in the Lansing Mall, and I was blown away. The arcade style, um, like, platforming, the graphics, the catchy-ass song, everything in it made me want to play more of it. And I was like, I gotta get that. And since Nintendo's gonna bring home Nintendo games and it said Nintendo VS Goonies, I was like, Fuck yeah! Get the Goonies! I'm gonna get that rich stuff. But this is what we got. And what I wanted was this. And you'll notice, I mean, my autofocus doesn't work, so I have to get it right. Well, I mean, you can probably tell that that's in Japanese, because this is a Famicom game. And it didn't even come out. Like, right away, when the Famicom came out. It wasn't a release title. Um, though most VS games were black box titles. So here I am, sitting there... <laughs> that was a shaking up a can of Coke and opening it in my brother's face, you fucking gross bastards. And I would just shake it, you know, and then I will grab the bottom and, like, tickle it. So then when I shake the can... I'm shaking a can of Coke! Jesus Christ. Dirty minds. A filthy mind is a filthy kind what I was told when I was a baby. Now, what? what's this? Oh, <laughs> I'm checking my, see, look, I got my script here, and it says I'm going to be dressing like a fucking pirate. <laughs> that ain't happening. I did it once already. If you want to check that out, that's on the Peter Pan and the Pirates video, which none of you fucking watched, so do that if you want to. I don't give a fuck. Um, yeah, but here's the deal. Here's the deal, guys. I was in fucking majorly in to the Goonies. Who wouldn't be? But, again, I was into this. Not so much this. I'll, how do I break this down for you? I know. The VS Goonies arcade game was created by Konami which means we don't know the individuals who created the game content outside of Konami's R&D department, until Sir Hideo Kojima of the Land of Kick-Ass decided to make it known on MGS1 that he was designer behind the classic stealth game Metal Gear Solid, the progenitor of an entire genre, Konami up until then had a very Atari outlook on their programmers and creative staff. You're no more important to the company than the people on the assembly line building the carts themselves. Appalling when said by Atari CEO Ray Kassar, but status quo for Konami. The VS cabinets were often two cabinets in one, tethered together to let two players play Hogan's Alley, Tennis, Excitebiker, Wild Gunman, or had two different games from the Black Label era to play. Goonies VS was usually in one cabinet, just a single cabinet. Pat Contry and RetroWare TV's video game years did a segment on the Versus cabinets 
check out a sneak peek. I've left a link in the description below as the show covers everything from Pong all the way up to the height of the NES and Master System. It's worth a binge watch. So I'm sure you're wondering, Goonies? I mean, he's an old fucker, so yeah, I guess so. He's trapped aboard a satellite, so I'm sure he's got that shit on repeat. Well, yeah, I do. And But look, I have got my data here on. I don't know if you can see my boxing glove. It goes all the way down to my big belly. My 007 belt. But I love the fucking Goonies. And you want to know why? You want to know why I love the Goonies? Pro wrestling. Yeah, simple as that. One Saturday morning, I woke up, and there was Cindy Lauper shooting a video. Or having a video on, on TV, and I was like, hey, great. Cindy Lauper. I love Cindy Lauper. I didn't at the time, but then I saw Freddie Blassie and Roddy Piper and Shiki Baby and Nikolai Volkov. Holy shit, there's great, there's fabulous Moolah. I was thinking the great Muda and fucking Snooka and Hogan were going to come out. They didn't. But in the video, you get Captain Lou Albano as well. You know, dude, Mario. That Mario guy. He's on there too. So I'm seeing all these wrestlers. I'm hyped. I'm listening to the song. And the video is is one of two. There's like two videos. One is Cindy Lauper, Good Enough, which the song is just called Good Enough by her definition. And then it was changed into Goonies Are Good Enough, which she doesn't mention a fucking Goonie or any Goonie-related material in the song. It's just about her trying to fit in, and her friends are good enough for her. And then the last half of it is just a straight-up fucking Goonies movie video. It has uh, Sean Astin and Corey Feldman and Thanos and um, ooh. Ah, Martha Plimpton. Sorry, I have a huge fucking crush on Martha Plimpton as well. It's my celeb crush. Um, oh, and Carrie. Uh, her name is Andy, um, the cheerleader girl. But uh, yeah, so the video was blo it blew me away. And I was like, wrestling in this movie? If the wrestlers are in this movie, I, I, I would fucking die. I I've been into wrestling forever. Now, it was going to be the MTV guy goes, who is a voiceover, I think. I think that's um, that fucking David Geffen guy goes, and be sure to check this movie out. It's called The Goonies. And I'm like, a fucking Goonies? It's an Indiana Jones-style movie, but with kids instead of Indiana Jones? And not Short Round? Well, not technically Short Round, because he's actually in the fucking... Uh, you, you know what I mean. Um, yeah, just take a look at the fucking game. I'm going to have to end that on... Yeah. <laughs> Check these videos out. I love Cindy Lauper. No lie. Ever since I was a little kid, I had a huge crush on this wild woman. Her videos were like something out of Pee Wee's Playhouse. And the Goonies video had every wrestler that was an awesome villain. They had Iron Sheik, Nikolai Volkov, Roddy Piper, Freddie Blassie, uh, even Matt Fabulous Moolah and uh, Andre the Giant were in the video. The movie centers around the Goonies a group of wise-ass 80s kids who are about to lose their homes to the expansion of a country club in Astoria, Washington. The goons go into the attic of Mikey's house because his parents are inattentive dicks and look around for rich stuff, something they might pawn off to save the goondocks. And after desecrating some fine art, they find a pirate map and a doubloon and a news clipping about Chester Copperpot, who went looking for the treasure of One-Eyed Willie, one of the greatest dick jokes in 80s history, by the way. And folks... Adventure and treasure and hijinks ensue. See, the Fratellis are on a crime spree following their exciting jailbreak of their eldest brother Jake, and he, along with Mama and Francis, escape to their seasonal hideout and abandoned lighthouse, a restaurant. And the Goonies fast talk their way in, pretending to be diners, and they find that they have begun an adventure of booby traps, pirate treasure, gangsters, guns, corpses, a big ass pirate ship, and a goddamn monster. This film is a classic, and you should check it out as soon as you can for stars. And that was a plug for Retroflix Reviews. You should. Man, explaining that movie again just makes me want to go out and get some rich stuff myself. Like I said, I'm not wearing no fucking costumes. Costumes are dumb. You know what, though? I bet there's some rich stuff aboard the old retro station. I'm not the first guy who's been here, clearly. Um, oh, Margot? Yes, Commander Dan. Margo, is there any rich stuff aboard the retro station? Affirmative. The retro station's twin reactors 
use hard water and plutonium for fuel. Each rod is worth approximately $2.2 billion in Earth currency. There are 24 rods. Additionally, the waste depleted uranium has a black market value of $29 million in Earth currency. What the fuck am I going to do with plutonium? Time machine? I, I don't have a DeLorean. And every time I ask the fucking station to make me a car, it's about this fucking big. Um, hmm. Are there any maps aboard the retro station? Like old-timey maps? Affirmative. The astronaut charts include yeah, everything no, in that, this sector. That's the Locally known on planet X Shit. as the hillbilly system. Several planetary atlases. What's that down there? For Earth. Hold on, everybody. Oh, check it out. Hidden gaming gems. Number one, related to gaming. And two, rich stuff. Fuck yeah. Let me see what this is. Wow, this book's pretty great. Not a plug, but I happen to know the the author, uh, Jeffrey w Wittenhagen. He's a cool dude. Really nice guy, as a matter of fact. I met him at the Midwest Gaming Expo. Let me... What's this? Graphics and sound of Jack the Nipper. Red River City Ransom. What was that? Something fell out of the book. One second. Oh. Oh. My God. $50 bills. No, I'm and it's not $50 bills. I wouldn't tell you if it was, but it is. A map to buried treasure. It's red lines all over this son of a bitch. I don't even know what I'm supposed to be following here. Check it out. It's so fucking cool. It's a map and every little fold out flippy piece. Wait a minute. So if I fold these two pieces together. <gasps> a doubloom. If I fold it together, it's a doubloom. Look at that! Ye intruders beware. I'm not an intruder. I'm trapped here. Margo! Yes, Commander. What is this? It appears to be a map written in the 17th century by famous Dutch pirate Big John Thomas. Legend has it he was brought aboard the retro station and in that time hit his biggest score, the lost treasure of Jello Cabra, somewhere aboard the retro station. You're telling me a pirate from the 17th century was aboard this retro station and his name was Big John Thomas? Well, you are scanning and reviewing V.S. Goonies. Wasn't the pirate captain in that film and the game named One-Eyed Willie? That's a good point. Looks like I'm going on an adventure myself. Hmm. You know what? I saw that movie, and if it was good enough for Cindy Lauper, it was good enough for me. And so in 1988, after I saw the movie, and in 1988, I caught that video game. Oh, my God. I saw that glorious cabinet in Aladdin's castle. I played the game, and it felt just like finding a hidden map in a, in a book. A border, well, not a border space station. Maybe there isn't an analogy for how big my heart got in those days but man that movie like I gotta tell you the event everyone has their own favorite Goonie of course mine is Data as you can see I'm regaled in my Data gear to talk about this very fun video game but I fell in love with the game and that ain't the game we got at home at all now I'm gonna go check out this rich shit because this looks like a map of the interior systems of the botanical gardens that provide me with both oxygen and turnips you know, you can live on terms for a long time. Sure as fuck can't get a pizza up here. I'm going to go check this out. You watch this. Konami's Goonies 2, created for the Nintendo Entertainment System in November of 1987, with music composed by Satoe Terashima, is the NES sequel to the Famicom and arcade game The Goonies. In this spiritual sequel to the movie, Mikey has to rescue the other six Goonies, Chunk, Mouth, Steph, Andy, Brandon, Data, and a mermaid named Annie. The game was released to fair critical acclaim, and though it was a difficult game, players seem to receive this game pretty well. I imagine it's from the amount of content within this cartridge. 
This game is huge, dense, unfair, random, and more complicated than a schizophrenic's relationship status. In other words, this is one you probably don't want to get involved with without lots of prep. And Xanax, probably. Seriously, I went into the Goonies 2 game thinking it was like its arcade-style forebear. And it was not. And the rule around the house was, remember, you beat the games you have, you can get a new game. And how the hell were you going to beat a game where to finish it, you need to punch a random old lady in the face five fucking times to get a needed item to finish the game? And without someone telling you what to do, that shit's not in the manual. You're royally cheese-fucked. So I went for years, having only played and beaten Goonies 2, never again getting a shot at the genius arcade game. Until now, that is. Now, remember my dad's diabolical plan to make sure that our gaming history was filled with just one game at a time to keep that, you know, that price tag low? Beat the game, or you can't get a new one. Well, he's diabolical, but guess what? I had this. This is the official Nintendo Player's Guide. You know what's in it? How about this? Ladies and gentlemen, every code to every early game, including the Goonies 2. That's right, the most inscrutable, dense, hard-playing fucking game in the history of games. Bam, full fucking map, look at that shit. So, beating this hunk of turd, it wasn't really a hunk of turd, it was actually a good game. Very hard though, very dense and very difficult. But beating that game? Easier than the time I ate my way to Godfather's Pizza. Or the time that Michael Jackson came over to my house to use the bathroom. Even easier, well, than doing the Truffle Shuffle, which I will not be doing for you today. Thank you very fucking much. So, I'm still on the lookout. I'm scanning over here on the ship's computers to where this map could be leading. The botanical area is very, very dense. It's also not really accessible to humans, so I'd have to send a probe droid in there. And I'm, I don't really have one of those accessible to me. Margo, can I have access to the... Negative. Commander Dan is not authorized to take control of Scudder units aboard the retro station. But no. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a big negative. So, um, I'll work this shit out, all right? But let me just tell you, because I'm an adult and we have eBay and I have a Retron 5, I now have access oh, to this gossamer dream of my childhood. It's fucking legendary. And you should take a, take a look at this while I try and finagle some kind of way to search out the botanical area from old Margo here. Konami's The Goonies for Famicom and the Versus Arcade System. This game was released in 1987 for the Famicom uh, by Konami, and other than the composer, we don't know much about who designed what. This never became a series. It was designed as an arcade game, not a console game. See, the console market and the way the industry thought of franchises hadn't really been established yet. Arcades were meant to serve up difficult, boutique interactions so that quarters would be spent and the player would feel as though they hadn't been screwed out of a quarter. Konami's arcade games were definitely a value-added proposition. Tutankham, Double Dribble... Hypersports, not to mention Contra, their games are usually good for a level or two of play without feeding another quarter into the machine. This wasn't the only version of the Goonies video game, by the way. There's also a Commodore 64 game and the MSX version where you play a sloth rescuing the Goonies. And did you know that sloth has a real name? He does. It's Lotney. Lotney Fratelli. That's right. You've been calling him sloth all these years is about the same thing as calling him dingleberry or butthole or retard. Not good names to call somebody whose name is Lotney, right? All right. Well, getting back to it. VS Goonies was another of Konami's challenging but fair arcade experiences. And with the gameplay and music and the charming cartoony graphics, it was a success in most arcades. Though this is anecdotal on my part. I did work at a mall arcade uh, in the 90s, and I found out that they had a couple of versus machines over time. And the owner said that the Play Choice 10 and the versus machines were very popular. But when I asked about Goonies, he said it was really hard to get a copy of that game because, well, they only sent about 12,000 copies to the U.S. And, you know, I didn't realize how lucky I'd been to actually play that game. That works perfectly, Margo. Just, yeah, get one of the, 
get one of the scudders to do it, and they'll search. Look, I'll scan the map in. Hold on, let me put it in over here. All right. And do you have the data? Yes, Commander. Daniel. Excellent. And now the scudders know where to go. Perfect. Yes, Commander. All right. I will monitor the screen. All right, folks. Let me tell you, this is pretty exciting. We get some fucking rich stuff. It is going to be great. So, uh, can we bring up a picture of um, the pirate Big John Thomas? Yes, Commander Dan. All right. Here he is, folks. This is what he He was also a one-eye willy. All right. Pretty fucking excellent. I bet he's got some great rich stuff. The story of the game is basically the story of the movie. You play as Mikey, and the Fratellis have kidnapped all the other kids. It's your job to descend under the lighthouse restaurant, going through the caverns and caves, and finally find the treasure aboard one-eyed willy's pirate ship. Mikey has a kick to stun the bilge rats and foxes, a jump that's pretty effective and can run. However, there are things like the Vitality Drink to give you a health boost, the Slingshot to give you a ranged attack, then there are the protective items in the game, the headphones to protect from Jake's singing, the raincoat protects you from waterfalls and drops of water, two levels of body armor, an anti-bomb suit and a suit of armor to give you more protection, you can get a football helmet to protect from stalactites, and you get spring shoes and lastly a golden cross that zaps all enemies on the screen to destroy them. Now that you're powered up, be ready to face dangerous rats, golden foxes, Jake and Francis Fratelli, bats, octopi, skulls, skeletons, and the ghost of one-eyed fucking Willie. You are in danger. I mean, this game oozes charm, and the music makes you feel like you're playing a game made to represent the actual movie. A real treat, and a real feat for 8-bit games of the time. You felt like you were actually seeking out pirate treasure as Mikey under this restaurant. A beautiful, beautiful game. Hmm. Well, man, you wouldn't believe the adventures I've been on. The Scudders, well, they found where we were supposed to go on the map, but all it led me to was a doubloon and this kick-ass pirate hat. And uh, the doubloon, if you match it up with the doubloon on the map. Yeah, I said doubloon, I don't care. I'm not British. Right. See? You match up the 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 bloom on the map here. Uh, the old bloom here. We'll stick them together, and it says the treasure is treasures in Astoria, Oregon. Fuck! Fuck shit, ass. Some bitch. And Margo, how far is Astoria, Oregon, from the retro station? Yes, Commander. The distance is 25,356 miles below this station on the night side of the planet. Earth. That's a hell of a fucking walk through deep space and pure vacuum, so... Fuck! Damn map. Stupid to bloom. Taking them all back! This is my dream! My wish! Shitballs. The game has six main levels and three uh, interstitial levels. Each main level, Mikey needs to rescue one of the kids, and to progress, you need to blow open the pirate doors to find keys, kids, and other power-ups behind the doors as well. Level one is the restaurant. It's the smallest of two levels in the game, uh, the other being One-Eyed Willie's ship. Level one's where you pick up the headphones and the flame suit. Not the bomb suit, like I said before, but what the hell am I going to do? It's been a long time since I played the game. Level 2 is the basement of the restaurant and the water treatment system under the goondocks, where one of the greatest bonus items in the history of video games can be found. Steven fucking Spielberg. No lie, check this shit out. This level's made up of three sections, and if you grab the flame suit in level 1, you got nothing to worry about from the flame spouts, and the headphones protect you from Jake's horrible singing. Be sure to pick up the raincoat here, because just about 70% of the traps in the game from here on out are water-based. Level 3 represents the last bit of civilization under Astoria and beginning of the pirate caves because you're attacked by the ghost of One-Eyed Willie here. Pick up the football helmet and the jump shoes at this level as well. 
level four is where we begin to see Willie's traps, and in my mind is where Chester Cobblepot must have met his end, since this is the first place we see skeletons and the boulder traps. In this stage, pick up the armor, which protects you from projectiles of all sorts, and the backpack, which gives you the ability to carry two bombs at once. Level five is the internal cove housing Willie's ship. Just below, that's where the ship lies. You can pick up power-ups you may have missed in this level and one of the kids. Now, if you don't have the five kids here, you don't get to the real ending. You go right back to level one. So, don't miss any of the kids in any of the levels. Level six is One-Eyed Willie's ship, and it's full of rich stuff. And Andy, she's the last person you rescue. And once you've rescued her, the game finishes and then loops back to level one since it's an arcade game. Now, we come to the final question of this series. So, does Goonies on the NES get the Retro Stations license to play? Yeah, of course it does! Oh my god, I would be, I would be hung by my childhood self if I told you this game wasn't the fucking shit. It is the bomb dibbity shibbity dibbities. I played it recently on a stream, and I grabbed some footage from Live Play, I think it's Long Plays, World of Long Plays. Shout out to those guys. Check out their channel. If you ever want to know what the beginning, middle, and end of any NES game was like, or practically any C64 game or Amiga game, check them the fuck out. And also, I will also be dropping this one in. This gets my license to play provisionally because I didn't really review this game. Uh, but check it out too. Both games are pretty inexpensive. You can find them online. And I know I didn't say, I, I said early on that I was going to mention prices. And I, I only want to mention them to say whether or not you should get them. I'm only going to mention the, the range that you can get them for on eBay. Um... I got my Goonies 2 for free, so this is my Goonies 2, but this cost me 15 bucks, I think. Shipping was free from Japan, um, from the seller. So eBay has a lot of great Famicom sellers, and right now Famicom games are dirt cheap. So if you're looking for a fun, amazingly fun time, and an amazingly easily relatable game, boom, Goonies, VS Goonies. Licensed to play approved. And in the meantime, I figured the map out, and it's not just the botany department, but if you look on the back of the map here, Shit balls. You know what? This little Mr. Big John Thomas has a fucking lot of explaining to do. You, you come here, you little bastard. I'm gonna shake the rich stuff right up. God! That's right. Number one, don't fuck with the retro station. Isn't that right, Mr. John Thomas? Our matey, yes, it is right. And you sit down over here. Two. Remember to stay Get retro. Upset on the internet. Peace. You're a salt adult. You're a salt adult. Get upset on the internet. You're a salt adult. Throwing out a hissy bit, you're abusing in the millions. And every up and comma is a threat to what you're dealing. And instead of getting better, you just spout up on your Facebook. Crying on your Twitter bit about how bad your case look. In case you didn't get it yet, allow me to rephrase it. Your grandma, then my boy, you rolled. I'm actually amazed. It. Like you couldn't even see the forest with the trees. The writing's on the wall. Bit of relief. See. How you getting so that a culture blowing up, man? I think there was a point where you stopped growing up, man. Instead of showing up, man, irrationally mad. Don't appropriate impression like the latest fashion fad. It isn't cool or funny to be acting like an edge lord. You alienate friends, pushing closer to the edge more. I don't know how to say it any way to make it clear. If you're the one and happy, then the problem's in the mirror. Get upset on the internet. You're a salt adult. You're a salt adult. Get upset on the internet. You're a salt adult. The net is a repository for the past expanses of human knowledge and all the technological advances And I can't say enough, how you gotta be open minded If you're looking for a fight, then you damn well find it an axe needs grinding, you're not alone There's a million other nerds who can bitch and moan and groan about how this is a relief
Please stay tuned.